And he was previously a career veteran with Chevron, uh, so he actually knows something about oil and gas. <laughs> he has worked at both in the United States and around the world as the uh, head of international and external affairs, and he was the company's principal uh, rep in Washington, D.C., so he knows something about what goes on in this city. Mr. Chow has uh, been published in uh, many international outlets. He's spoken on energy issues around the world. And I'd like to note that he's the author of a recent report on the uh, limited effects, that are, the often limited effects of sanctions on, uh, in major commodity producing countries. It's a crucial topic, I think, for, uh, for us to talk about, consider today. And Hannah Thorman is a uh, research fellow at the Hudson Institute, where she uh, focuses on Eastern European politics. She's a frequent media uh, commentator on developments in Russia, Ukraine. Uh, her, she writes so widely and is published in Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, many places. Uh, in her life, amongst many other things, she was a teaching fellow at Yale and spent two years in the Peace Corps in southern Ukraine. So I think first-hand experience on, on the, uh, we'll call it the chaos that we're now ignoring <laughs> for, in the political cycle. She speaks Russian, Ukrainian, and Spanish. That's re remarkable and important. And uh, it's a very timely combination in the global geopolitics. And she worked recently, uh, I, I saw as a chief research and editor uh, of a, the book, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, operative in the, in the Kremlin, and I think, again, makes it very timely and relevant. Look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you. Uh, so thanks to you all for, for being here today and uh, for Arthur for, for organizing this. I'm going to apologize at the beginning. I'm a little under the weather today, so please excuse any uh, lapses in speech or brain activity. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of take take the initial lead here and uh, just start off with a few basic facts uh, about where Europe stands today when it comes to uh, energy, LNG in particular, and what shale gas is going to mean for that. And then I'll focus just a little bit more on uh, the Eastern European countries and how they're beginning to look at the U.S. shale revolution and what that they really think that that means for their uh, future energy security. Uh, so a few facts. 28 EU countries import 53% of their energy needs. In 2013, it imported 305 billion cubic meters of natural gas. And of that, Russia supplied 39%. Norway supplied 33%. And North Africa, generally meaning uh, Algeria, Libya, supplied 22%. Uh, as of my last count, and I could be off by this now. Uh, Europe has 20 LNG import terminals. We may be up by one or two. Perhaps Ed can correct me, but more are under construction. On the Russian side, 71% of Russian gas exports go to the European market. They're attempting to diversify away from the European market and send uh, gas exports uh, to China, most notably, but that's a very uh, long-term work in progress. So as I said, I'm going to speak mostly about the manner in which uh, these Eastern European nations, uh, most of which are really increasingly eager to achieve energy independence from that uh, Russian gas export, uh, and how it's, you know, the, it, it's a long Soviet legacy, these gas pipelines, when all of these nations were members of the Soviet bloc, were built uh, ever slowly towards the West. And so many of these countries have been, in a way, bound by those gas pipelines. That's what runs their infrastructure. That's what heats their homes. And that's what powers their businesses. But since Russia really began to use energy as a weapon, most notably in 2006, uh, 2009, when it had uh, particular conflicts with the Ukrainians and it decided to shut off gas exports both to Ukraine as well as to the rest of Europe, you remember stories about Slovakia having to turn on an old nuclear power plant in order to heat its homes. Uh, the, the European nations really started to sit up and take notice that it was, in fact, a great economic danger for them to be so beholden to these Russian gas imports. And so for that reason, many of these Eastern European countries, particularly those lucky enough to have a coastline, have really been looking for ways to diversify away from Russia. And so the U.S. shale revolution, uh, coupled with the falling oil prices have really provided them an opportunity. So I'm going to focus particularly on two, that's Lithuania and Poland. Lithuania has really been at the forefront of attempting to diversify away from Russian gas imports. 
Uh, they opened in 2014 a kind of floating LNG storage and regasification terminal at the port in Klaipeda called very appropriately Independence. Uh, they'd been very, very eager to purchase LNG from the United States. They were at the forefront of lobbying the U.S. government to lift uh, the, the oil and LNG export ban. And they've been negotiating with Chenier Energy in Texas to hopefully purchase some of the gas that's going to be coming out of the Sabine Pass facility. Unfortunately, it seems now that some of the, the mixture from the Sabine Pass facility is not appropriate for use in the Klaipeda facility, but they're still working uh, together with U.S producers to attempt to make that eventually work. But even though it doesn't seem as though now Klaipit is going to be able to take in some of this U.S. gas, what it does and what it has really been successful at already is making it clear to the Russians that they're going to have to drive a harder bargain. Right now, much of the gas that the Lithuanians are taking in comes from Norway. Uh, and you'll see the same thing with Poland, which is getting a lot of LNG from Qatar. Uh, but they're now realizing, the Russians are, that they're going to have a lot of competition. And now as, as Lithuania is looking, uh, it has coming to the end of its contract with Gazprom at the end of this year, they're looking at the U.S. shale revolution, they're looking at all of these new opportunities uh, in shale gas as a kind of way to help push Russia down on the very high prices that it had been demanding in the past. It's also been able to export some of this gas that it's been taking into its uh, neighbors, Latvia and Estonia. Poland is also doing something similar. Uh, it's in the process of opening its first LNG terminal right there on the Polish-German uh, border, again, on the Baltic Sea. It's also preparing to accept its first shipments, mostly from Qatar, as far as I understand. But it's also planning on expanding its gas grid further into Central Europe and working with its Visegrad 4 partners in order to help them also achieve energy independence away from Russia and looking at exporting that gas that they receive at this new terminal to the Czech Republic, Slovakia, perhaps Lithuania and Ukraine as well. One other note, Lithuania and Poland as well as Ukraine have actually attempted to do their own shale gas exploration. Uh, and as of now, Lithuania and Poland have found that it's just not uh, generally going to be economically viable for them to do. Uh, in Ukraine, it seems a bit more uh, as though there may be some possibilities there, but perhaps Ed can say a little bit more about it. But I believe a lot of the what, what people believe are shale gas reserves are actually under the Donbass region, which is, of course, occupied uh, by terrorists, Russian fighters, whatever you'd like to term them. It's not under the control of the Ukrainian government right now. But it does seem as though it may have some potential. But all in all, you're looking at a situation where these Eastern European countries are really looking at what's happening here in the US with the shale gas and looking at it as a way to help diversify away from what they've seen as the sort of insidious geopolitical influence of Russian energy, of Russian energy being used as a weapon. Uh, and they're very, very eager to increasingly work uh, with us. They're eager to see more of these exports uh, and I would be perfectly thrilled if that would be able to happen. So I'll stop there. Um, Hannah, thank you. You must have, must have something to do with my invitation to Hudson Institute. Uh, thank you for- Only perhaps. Uh, uh, and Hudson for inviting me to this uh, conference. Um, Mark was kind enough to point out my background that, that my bias is, is, is that of industry uh, where I started even though I've been dabbling in policy for the last uh, several years. Um, and, and so from the perspective of the industry, I, I tend to assess what's possible, what's not possible in the industry context, which puts some limits of uh, the usefulness of energy as a foreign policy tool, uh, but as well as maybe uh, shed some light uh, on its potential. So I'm, I'm going to start from industry, and because this is the first panel, I, I think it is useful to remind people that the shale revolution didn't happen overnight. It seems to us that it has happened overnight, last five years for oil, last seven, eight, nine years for gas. But it had a very long gestation, starting with basic research and development in the 60s and 70s, when the price of gas was very low, but we, we 
uh, uh, through our universities, through our research universities, our national labs, the Department of Energy sponsored uh, a number of research projects in, into uh, um, the potential of hydraulic uh, uh, fracturing. Um, and um, seemingly unrelated technology advances, Mark was, was again uh, kind enough to mention elements of the IT revolution that enabled uh, the, the shale revolution, seemingly unrelated. The culture of innovation uh, in, in, in this country, um, the fact that um, uh, people own mineral rights under the subsoil, which is unusual around the world. Uh, the shale revolution was, was uh, uh, powered uh, through private lands, not public lands. Uh, the in, industry structure uh, in North America that's very different from the rest of, of, of the world. We have a com not only a competitive oil industry, we have a competitive services and equipment industry that was very uh, important in terms of its responsiveness uh, as well as ability to cut costs. The availability of risk capital. Um, it's not just Silicon Valley, you know. Those good old boys in Oklahoma City have been tapping uh, uh, venture capital for an awful long time. We didn't call it that, but, but that's been very, very important. The reason I cited some of these conditions is that it's important to remember them as we think about how easily uh, this technology that we're perfecting in North America, how easily that is to, can be transferred in other parts of the world where the same conditions uh, don't, don't exist. And it may give uh, countries some clues as to what are the reforms that would be necessary in their economic structure if that is something that they want to do. Um, the impact on Europe was evident way before we started even thinking about exporting uh, LNG, it seems to me. The, the mere fact that we at one time were uh, considered to be a, a major LNG importer, uh, once the shale revolution started, it, it allowed, um, freed up LNG cargoes that were previously destined or projects whose cargoes were previously destined for North America were now available to the world market. It, it provided liquidity that otherwise wouldn't have been available in, in trading. It was tremendously helpful for the Japanese in, 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 in light of the Fukushima disaster, uh, for example. Similarly had impact on, on Europe. North Atlantic LNG cargoes the United States were no longer taking or, or uh, that had been planned to be taking uh, were now available to, to Western Europe. Even before the, the, the price drop in 2014, which started in July of 2014, Gazprom and other major gas suppliers to Europe were renegotiating contracts. Um, the contracts where the, the pricing is fundamentally indexed to oil, they were providing contract flexibility, not only Gazprom, but Stat Oil and Sun and Track and, and, and others. So uh, even before we export a single molecule, we've been helpful um, the, uh, to, to Europe. And of course, just last week, uh, the first cargo uh, of US LNG arrived at its destination. Interestingly, it was um, Brazil. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the first Chenier cargo arrived at a terminal outside of Rio last week. I happened to be in Rio at the time, must have been a coincidence. Um, and and um, th this is interesting to, to think about because it, it, it could be the greatest regional impact the U.S. shale revolution will have would be in, in, in Latin America um, more, more than anywhere where, where else. Um, so even if Europe doesn't import a single molecule, it will benefit because we now have a source of uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, into the world market whose pricing is not re related to oil at all. It's related to gas on gas competition in the United States. And the price of gas today is Nico's dollar eighty-five, something like that, very low. And, and so there's a lot of margin to play with, uh, even though global LNG pricing ha has also uh, come down. Uh, quite a bit. The crude oil export ban removal also has an impact on, on, on Europe. 
Um, it used to be that we have a pretty balanced trade uh, in refined products with Europe. Um, we would uh, import gasoline from Europe, and we would export gas oil or diesel uh, uh, to, to Europe because they're usually uh, short of, of, of diesel. Well, the, the shale revolution and the fact that we had restrictions on crude oil exports had completely flipped that uh, uh, formula where we were exporting both gasoline and um, uh, uh, gas oil uh, to Europe and basically eating European refiners' lunch. Uh, our, our refineries were operating at 95 96% utilization rates. Their refineries were running at 60% utilization rates, about to go bankrupt, should be shut down, and, and, and so on. So the fact that we are now able to export light sweet crude, um, which the uh, tight oil uh, generally uh, uh, produces, uh, to Europe where their refineries are more suited to uh, uh, ref process that quality of crude, and we can continue to uh, import cheaper heavy and sour crudes is, is very beneficial for the uh, trading in uh, petroleum products and has an energy security implication because we don't really want our NATO allies uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Europe to be completely dependent on refined product imports where their refineries are no longer are operating. So uh, it definitely has um, any security uh, implications and very beneficial uh, for Europe. It is interesting that uh, the, the price collapse that the shale revolution has contributed to had seemingly had had no effect on Europe's anemic economic growth. You would think that a major uh, oil and gas importing region uh, should be enjoying a boost in, 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 uh, in its economy with much lower energy prices, but we haven't seen that so far. We haven't really seen uh, uh, in spite of efforts by the Department of State and Energy, much success in transferring shale uh, uh, revolution uh, abroad. A part of it is uh, because um, of, of uh, restrictions by them, and I'm thinking specifically of, of Western Europe, uh, we have a de facto ban in fracking uh, uh, in Germany. We have a de jure ban of fracking in France, two of the most prospective countries to major gas importers uh, uh, in Europe. So we have the ironic condition that um, 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 Germany is uh, 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 running more coal-fired generation today, increasing their greenhouse gas emissions uh, because coal is so much cheaper, and, and shutting down um, uh, gas generation and restricting their own potential for producing domestic natural gas. I don't know what the French are going to do since the renovation uh, or the renewal of the nuclear industry hasn't been going particularly well in France and Finland or in Britain uh, re recently. So what if... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, prolonging the life of nuclear uh, power in France doesn't work out economically as well as they had hoped. What are they going to turn to? Are they going to continue to, to import gas and not look at their own resources? There's a lesson here of tapping your own indigenous resources in North America that your West Europeans in particular should think about. Central and Eastern Europe where Hannah and I spend a bit of time. It's a more complicated story, it seems to me. Um, part of the problems is that rocks weren't there in Poland and, and Lithuania and Romania. Uh, part of the problem is that they have uh, uh, them, uh, you know, sort of start squeezing the goose before it has a chance to lay any eggs in terms of the restrictive conditions they put on companies that were just venturing on exploring uh, shale possibility in, in their countries. A lot of the energy vulnerability had to do with the lack of interconnectors, uh, lack of market integration, mainly because of incumbent companies, a lot of them state-owned companies, uh, that, that do not want competition in their marketplaces. 
Uh, and, and that's a problem that Central and Eastern Europe needs to solve. And I, I think some countries are addressing it better uh, than, than, than others, I, I would say. If you want to see the poster child of, um, of uh, energy corruption in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, then look at a map of Ukraine, uh, where we both have spent a bit of time. I, I just came back from Ukraine uh, at the beginning of the month. Uh, the, the situation hasn't improved very much, uh, I'm afraid. So a lot of it is within uh, uh, the, um, uh, the control of European uh, uh, countries in terms of, of policy, in terms of market integration, in, in terms of demanding from their major gas suppliers, including Gazprom, um, um, uh, commercial terms uh, that are market-related rather than has the political costs associated with it. You know, two, three years after the EU started the investigation of Gazprom, we're still waiting to find out what the resolution is going to be. And, and those are things that Europe can do for themselves and, and are not re directly related to what North America can do for them. Thank you. Or the questions, I would take the prerogative of asking each of our uh, panelists the first question. And uh, focusing on natural gas, and Hannah, you uh, uh, and both of you raised some extremely important points, but looking at natural gas and picking up on Edward's observation that, uh, which is uh, of course correct, that the United States, by virtue of its increased production, already began to impact world markets over the last five years. We saw the ripple effect. Um, and we, we could expect it to continue, and we could expect a downward pressure on gas prices to continue without regard to physical export, right, because we took pressure off markets. The interesting question, Hannah, for you, is uh, the extent to which we've already seen, but how much more change in geopolitical behavior, not looking for shale gas or trying to produce it with all the, we, Edward uh, ably articulated the non-trivial challenges. I have a question for you in a second on that. What do you think will happen, though, considering that natural gas in the United States, everyone knows this now in Europe, in Russia, it's essentially free. I mean, buck 80. This is like, it's, they burn it off, you know, trying to stop flaring because it's, it's trash. I mean, it's got so much gas, it's sort of gushing out of America. So the prices going forward are set low, 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 the Ford price. What do the Russians do? I mean, how do they behave? Because this matters, right? Their exports, 70% of all their export revenues are gas and oil. Their influence is gas and oil. Not setting aside what other countries do to find their own, but what is this, how does this, this affect these bilateral negotiations and the Russia's posture? They take, have less money to spend on troops, obviously, right? And they know when they're negotiating these contracts with Lithuania, with Poland, with, that they've got this huge looming potential. The United States will come in and say, oh, here's our gas. What, how do you see that going forward? Do you, how do you see their behavior changing? Or do, the, do you see Russia's behavior changing? No, it's a very important, I think a very interesting question because you're now seeing uh, one of the, the sort of biggest, most interesting developments in, in the European energy market, and I think we sort of oddly didn't mention it, is this idea of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that both Russia and Germany are starting to think about uh, building. And when you talk to most European partners, you know, the Italians, for instance, the Southern Europeans are extremely angry about this idea that Germany might now be building a second Nord Stream pipeline in conjunction with Russia after the South Stream pipeline was scuttled for essentially not living up to uh, the rules of, of free trade and the, the ideas behind uh, European energy security. And they're now looking at Germany and Russia and saying, hold on, hold on, what exactly is going on here? But you do still see, I think, that the Germans, at least from, from the discussions I've had, the Germans are looking at this new perhaps, you know, potential deal with the Russians and, uh, as a way to, one, rebuild their relationship with Russia after everything that's happened. Uh, they're looking at it, uh, particularly from the German business community, again, is looking at it. They're very powerful. They're a very strong lobby. And they're, they're really looking at trying to rebuild those ties that have been broken between the Russians. So in a way, the Russians have a a different way of going about these things simply because they are Russia and people still want to maintain those ties. But it's not going to be the case in every single country that they're going to have access to you know, US gas or to LNG. And of course, it's pushed those prices down. 
but Russia has plenty of other ways of going about uh, convincing people to sign on to these kinds of agreements. And yes, they're going to end up with less money no matter what. They're going to have to come down a bit on their prices, if not a lot on their prices. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're still going, I think, to rely on some of those old relationships and say, you know, to Bulgaria or to whomever it may be, uh, look, we have a longstanding relationship. Uh, if you still want to buy our weapons, you still want to do business with us, then we're going to coerce you to continue to buy our gas because it is hydrocarbon revenues uh, over the past 10, 15 years have traditionally made up about 50% of the Russian budget. And uh, when you look at both the falling oil prices and the falling gas prices, they're in a really tough spot. It's interesting because what this is, this, you know, I always visualize geopolitics like the, the child's balloon. When you squeeze it in one place, it inflates in another. This is almost a, a in an odd way, it gives Russia some power and the, in the, a lot of the European nations by virtue of reengaging negotiations that bef earlier were simply unilateral. Yeah, in a way. I think that's right. Well, I have a question for you as a, as, a, uh, as a real practitioner in a real corporation of great scale. Chevron's one of the great, great uh, storing companies of uh, the world's hydrocarbons. It still is a, a marvelous country, company. So you correctly uh, pointed out that uh, industrial realities matter. I mean, this, when you actually have to build things, it, it matters. Uh, these scales are extraordinary. So you made a very important point, which I glossed over, which has relevance here to the geopolitics. And I wanted to, you to address it a little more deeply. The United States has spent maybe a trillion dollars in private capital, in aggregate, in creating a, creating a shale infrastructure that service companies, not just the wells and the rigs, the steel, um, sand, all the rest. That's an extraordinary, and we have the, the economic advantage of, of mineral rights. We have free capital and open capital markets, uh, vibrant capital markets in, in Houston and in Oklahoma City and in Denver. I, I, in my view, and I wonder if you disagree, is that it's not that there's a shell elsewhere in the, elsewhere in the world, but the, the advantages that the United States have in being early and its other structural advantages are so overwhelming that it is, for all practical purposes, the shale place. It doesn't matter that Russia has the biggest shale field in the world in Siberia. Who cares? China has enormous shale fields. They don't have private property rights. The fact of our extraordinary advantage is essentially, it, we'll see if you agree, permanent. And that advantage will confer some very significant geopolitical tail. No matter what we do about talking about transferring the technology, it's a practical matter. When you build something, if you're Chevron or if you're a small guy, where are you going to go? You're going to expand here if prices merit. How, first, do you agree that that is a, essentially, for all practical purposes, a permanent, and by that I mean decades, two decades? And do you see companies like Chevron stepping up the game like Exxon did and others, refocusing on the North American markets to do this as a, as a play? And then how does that play out? Uh, really good question. Uh, is it a permanent advantage? Yes, it is a permanent advantage. Uh, I guess I'm enough of a technology optimist to think that technology that may have been perfected in North America will never be transferred outside of North America, that other people would adapt. Um, you know, maybe the Chinese can't do shale gas our way, but they'll do shale gas with Chinese characteristics. Um, you know, the Argentines, you, you see what the Mexicans are trying to right. do now by carving out separate conditions yep. uh, uh, for, for shale and deep water. Uh, so so I, I, I think what we been missing so far internationally is a success story. And I don't know where that success story is going to come. Maybe it'll come in Morocco, South Africa. Who knows where it's going to come. But once or, or the Golan Heights. Or the Golan Heights, uh, where Israel may have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which makes the Golan Heights even more. Obvious. Exactly. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I think if you had a success story, Everyone else will have to re-examine right. their presumptions right. of whether it's possible or, 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 or not, and how they may be able to um, adapt to mimic some of the conditions uh, 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 that we uh, deal with. I, I'll make one more point about share. Um, I'm sorry, I lost you. Um, uh, 
the, this great company I used to work for um, just had its first cargo of LNG shipped out of the Gorgon right, gas Gorgon. field. Yep. The Gorgon gas field, where the first LNG cargo, and it will have a capacity of about 15 million tons per year, so well-scale project, was discovered in 1981. So the difference between deep water or conventional plays with long gestation, but more important, very heavy capital costs, the, the, the business model is very different from unconventional oil and gas, where you have very low capital costs, but higher operation, operating costs. Right. And the higher operating costs is something that you can be resilient in driving down over time with improvement in efficiency. Uh, so your, your, your upfront capital risk is not as high. Uh, and if the price rise up, you can produce more. You can drill more wells. You, you can hire more rigs uh, and so on. So, so it's much more flexible. I mean, I don't know that it would ever be as flexible as the Saudi fields. But, but it's a lot more flexible than having to say, okay, prices are $100 now, we're going to invest a lot of money, and maybe 15 years later we'll start producing oil and gas. This is something that can come back very quickly, and that makes unconventional oil and gas production uh, a game changer in, in a different way. Um, it's a, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I think it's been insufficiently appreciated. It's, it's I, the word I use for this is velocity, of course, because it, it all boils down to how quickly you can make significant additions to supply. And the velocity is, uh, is extraordinarily disruptive. But I want to take uh, questions from the, uh, from the audience for, for both of you. So, uh, gentlemen over here, and the, thank you. Jamie Horgan uh, with the American Interest. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the way the shale revolution is changing the way Gazprom is dealing with contracts uh, in Europe. Uh, specifically, I guess, not only the fact that we have gas, LNG that we could send as an alternative to Gazprom gas, but also um, with linking their, their contracts to the price of oil, uh, our, the shale revolution and the oil that we're contributing is bringing, has helped contribute to the price collapse. So is, is that, affecting the way gas problem is going to go forward with their long-term take or pay linked to the price of oil contracts. Uh, how much how much do you think shale is going to contribute to that? Uh, well, as, as I indicated uh, at, at the beginning, uh, it has already impacted it some. Uh, whether this is going to be a permanent change or not, coupled with uh, some uh, regulatory robustness on the part of e Europe uh, to finally uh, uh, enforce the, their own rules. Uh, we, we will see. But Gazprom has tremendous ability to protect market share. Uh, it has, by most accounts, over 150 billion cubic meters worth of annual capacity that's currently not utilizing for lack of a, a market. Uh, the pivot to China or to Asia isn't working uh, very fast, uh, as, as Hannah already indicated. Um, and, and to me, that's why Nord Stream 2. Yeah. Uh, it's a re-pivot uh, back to Europe. The European market is really important. If that means uh, 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 no longer long-term uh, um, take or pay uh, contracts with destination clauses and so on, they will have to become more flexible if they want to fight for market share. Uh, we will see. The other thing I would say is that Nord Stream 2 is also a tool for dividing Europe on the sanctions question. Uh, so so, so it, it serves both a, a, a political purpose as well as an economic purpose. And, and, I think, a, I and think, a voice Ukraine transit risk at the same time, of course. Yeah, and I think on the Nord Stream 2 question, it's, it's been very interesting just to see the discussions between Europeans on this because Nord Stream 1 is not even used at its full capacity at this point. So the idea of having a second uh, pipeline that you may or may not use, but of course this depends on where Germany goes, it seems a reasonably tenuous prospect. But yeah, I think Ed's completely right. Gazprom is going to work to keep its market share no matter what, and they're going to have to create some flexibility. And even if 
say the U.S. is able to export enough LNG uh, to, to some of these terminals throughout Europe, particularly in Eastern Europe, they're still going to work with those countries, I think, to try and keep at least a certain market share with them because they don't want to completely lose that market and they do want to maintain the infrastructure that they already have. It's just a matter of how they're going to go about that. And I think that um, generally remains to be seen. Other question? Gentlemen over here. World X. Uh, how fast is Norwegian gas production declining? It's not declining. Well, it's not declining. It's increasing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. High. yeah. Oh, there, there's there's still a lot of potential in in offshore Norway for gas. And, and in the Gulf of Mexico, and off of Brazil, the world is gushing oil and gas. That's one of my themes for 30 years. But we have time for one more uh, question. It's it's, it's the UK North Sea that yeah. that, that is declining in in production. Yeah. And actually, I'll just mention one little thing. I think it was it was I saw just this morning there was an interesting little piece of of news that a Swiss company called Ineos has just, they were, they're calling it uh, the first LNG or US LNG shipment, but it's actually ethane that comes from the Marcellus Shale field in Pennsylvania that was just exported to this Swiss company that's working in Scotland and Norway. And they're actually beginning to use the ethane from our shale fields because the North Sea is starting to decline in its production. Gentlemen back here in the blue sweater. Uh, regarding uh, the, the uh, production of, of gas from uh, by the fracking method, uh, could you um, say a few words about uh, the environmental costs associated with this and how that would affect uh, the price of uh, gas from, from fracking operations? Well, I mean, I, I don't... So there's a lot of urban myth about the environmental costs. Uh, the environmental costs are not much different from conventional oil and gas production. Um, so, uh, and it doesn't have much to have to do with the fracking process itself, but on issues like wastewater dis disposal, uh, methane uh, emissions during the gas processing uh, process rather than the production process. Uh, and state and federal regulators are tightening the regulations on uh, on them. Um, the uh, you know, things like uh, the integrity of the well casing, uh, you know, affects unconventional or or uh, um, conventional drilling pretty much the same way. Uh, the hydraulic fracturing is actually taking place, you know, thousands of feet below the water table. So by itself, it's not the, the problem. But anytime you have indus a lot of industrial activity, there's going to be uh, uh, concerns, uh, legitimate concerns that need to be attended to. I have a question. I'm going to take the prerogative sure. to ask this question. Um, and specifically on this point in the European context, and as you know, for many of the countries which have imposed moratoriums on fracking and other kinds of unconventional uh, extraction of shale, reserve, shale resources, a lot of it comes from pressure, pressure from green groups and from environmental lobbies. Uh, in 2014, the former Secretary General of NATO, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, made a speech in which he said there was very strong evidence that much of the, that at least some of the environmental opposition to fracking in Europe, which would promote energy independence, in fact comes from Russia. And that it is part of Putin's policy to encourage that kind of green opposition for obvious reasons as we've learned from this panel. Any comment from either of you on that point? More yeah, there, there was actually a, a sort of very large uh, New York Times article about, I think about in 2014, that, that really did a, a pretty serious investigation into this, particularly in Romania. And it was generally found, and you know, it seems now that, that fracking is just not going to be sustainable in Romania, but at the time, there was evidence that there was Russian funding of green groups uh, in Romania to come out to these potential fracking sites and to make the environment so... Um, untenable for these companies that they would withdraw. And that's, in fact, what happened in Romania. 
And it did become a very large scandal, and local politicians were involved because they were on the take from these sort of uh, very dubious kinds of groups. But yeah, it's certainly been a, a concern, particularly in some of these Eastern European countries. And you know, it, it's, it's also a concern when it just comes to general political parties. The uh, Front National in France is taking loans from Russian banks uh, and financing their political campaigns that way. So it's certainly a, it's a concern both in the political realm as well as in the environmental realm as a kind of way for Russia to perhaps forestall even further damages to their, their market share in Europe. What, what was interesting about that was that Chevron, again, for some reason, uh, uh, <laughs> was everywhere. the company in Romania, wasn't even trying to do fracking no. in Romania. It was just doing exploratory drilling to find out whether there's potential for hydraulic fracturing or not. So, so it seems to me a government has the responsibility of finding out whether the resources is there or not, and then uh, uh, figure out what are the conditions under which maybe it will permit the exploitation of that resource. But, uh, but that's what the environmental groups are, are against. And I guess there's a cookbook somewhere on how to print out these pamphlets, because the ones in Lithuania, Bulgaria, Romania They're all very uh, similar. are remarkably similar. Yeah. Anyway, I want to thank our two panelists and our moderator for an absolutely marvelous session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.